Welcome everyone. I am very happy to welcome those who are on Zoom with us and those who are live on Facebook. This is part two of a critique of symbols of Jamaican nationhood. In fact, we are discussing today the people's symbols. We are here in this summer series of engagements on critical issues, issues of culture, history. This is part two and the role of the university. Friends and colleagues, I began our session two weeks ago with lyrics from Egyptian. These are some serious times. But today, I will continue to sing redemption songs and share in honor of His Imperial Majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie, on his 128th Earth Day. Today, I will share words from Bujibantan, hills and valleys. Only Rasta can liberate the people. Don't let them fool you. Many live this life without having a clue, no moment to reflect on the cycles of life. Let them know we won't go home our yard. Fittingly, therefore, we are examining the people's symbols and His Imperial Majesty is one of the important symbols for many in Jamaica and beyond, even those who don't declare themselves to be Rastas. The ICS as a teaching and research institution honors the legacy of His Imperial Majesty through the offering of courses, research, and advocacy around Rastafari studies, for which there is also a minor. So for those of you who have an interest in pursuing higher education, we are definitely able to satisfy your needs through our cultural studies and applied cultural studies program. And yes, we are teaching Rastafari studies at the University of the West Indies. Our exercise as an ethical university is about liberation. And so today, we bring you a critical engagement of symbols of Jamaican nationhood, the people's symbols, with a lineup of six fantastic speakers who are grounded in the observation, study, and documentation of people's symbols. Before our speakers, though, I express gratitude again. This event is a partnership. I want to thank the National Council on Reparation and the Center for Reparations Research for both engaging with the Institute of Caribbean Studies and also for their continued support in maintaining attention around key issues in relation to our daily life in a post-colonial world. I am Sonia Stanley Naya, Director of the Institute of Caribbean Studies and the Reggae Studies Unit, and I'm your moderator today. So without further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Bert Samuels. He is going to be speaking to us about the role of British laws in the oppression of African Jamaicans. Bert is a Pan-Africanist attorney and co-chair of the National Council on Reparation. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule, Mr. Samuels. Over to you. Greetings, greetings to all. <laughs> yes, um, am I being heard? We're hearing you loud and clear, Bert. Hi, and it's great to be with this um, gathering of friends and like-minded persons. I know I have 15 minutes, so I'd like to go straight to it. Uh, many people may not know, but during our enslavement as a people, there was a case which came up in 1772 called the Somerset case in England, where an uh, enslaved African was on a ship in the British Harbor, and it was an application was made to free him, release him. And the Somerset case decided that enslavement could not take place on British soil in England. So one of the, the weird things was that this was 1772, you will find that in Jamaica, slavery was legal, and it was part of the British Empire. So you could be an enslaved person in one part of the British Empire, but you could be also a, a, a person who could not be enslaved on British soil. So the contradictions continued. And that moved now for us to understand the institutions which came out of our enslavement. And I'm rushing, and I'm deciding to deal with UWI firstly. As you know, the UWI, 
we cannot, no student can get their rights before last year unless the visitor in the form of the Queen of England was the person to whom students should appeal for justice on the UWI campus, the center of learning in the, in, in the Caribbean. And therefore, what that's one of the symbols of the Queen of England dictating the, 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 the lives of students in, in the highest institution of learning. And therefore, that is one of the symbols which was just changed, yes, last year by causing it to be come home to the West Indies, that particular visitor. So I went to court for Dr. Matt Myrie, who was contesting an exam which he was not allowed to sit. And when I went before the court to get justice under the Jamaican constitution, the lawyers for the UWI at the time argued that he could not come to the courts of Jamaica, he had to go to the Queen of England as a visitor. So that's one of the institutions which were just managed to have changed. Now I want to go to other areas of law, how we have been, as it were, imprisoned by British law. And one of the things that you find is that before 1975, all children born out of wedlock were deemed to be bastards. And how did that play out? So that the majority of Jamaican children under the British colonial laws could not inherit their father's property if he left no will. Now the majority of Jamaicans don't leave a will. So that if a man had children with his wife, but had children out of wedlock elsewhere, the children with his wife could inherit property if he left no will because the law protected those children. But as it were, the children born out of wedlock. So what that meant is that the majority of Jamaican children before 1975, one could not have their father's name registered on their certificate of birth and they could not inherit where their father left no property for them. And that has caused, as it were, the discrimination of the majority of African Jamaican people under British law. Not until 1974, the Status of Children Act, as it were, outlawed the bastardy law. There's a, an act which was passed in 1926, which is called the bastardy law. Now, if you know, if you go to England and call a person a bastard, that is, that is a profanity. It is, it is a bad word, as it were but so that the majority of Jamaican, African Jamaican children were deemed to be bastards before 1974. Now we go to family law. One of the things about being educated under British law is that we begin to feel that when African Jamaicans came, when Africans came to Jamaica, we brought no laws because we were so uncivilized. We did not bring laws here. Now, what we have to understand that within the African context, the family land cannot be disposed of. So that under British law, a man can decide to give his sweetheart all of his estate and leave his children and his wife and his children landless. In under African law, family land cannot be disposed of outside of the family. And that is why landlessness has caused so much hurt to our people. And to add to that, after 1838, crown lands, lands belonging to the British, stolen from the Spanish, who stole it from the Tainas, was now vested in the crown of England. We still maintain a crown land principle in Jamaica, which no one can go on and settle and claim. You can go on, on a private land and settle on it for 12 years and claim it. You can't go on to crown lands because this belongs to the British Empire. So we are now seeing that landlessness is something that was dictated by British law. And that's another area of law which has caused hurt to African Jamaicans. Now, because of the celebration of his Imperial Majesty, I want to go to the treatment of Rastafari under British law and under colonial law. The first thing is that Rastafarians were never accepted as a religion. You can't be marriage officers and you can't carry out the rights of other religions. So it was inherently discriminated against. But I recall in 2003 that when Rastafari was to be imprisoned, as you enter the general penitentiary or the Spanish town prisons, you were trimmed. You had to be trimmed. There wasn't a single lock bearing African Jamaican in Jamaican prisons before 2003. I had the privilege of going to court and have that reversed. But what happened is that outside of the prisons, 
African Jamaican children could not wear locks to school. And maybe we think that that struggle is over. It is not over because right now at the Kensington Primary, Kensington School, you have a situation where a locked child has been shut out and they, we had to go to court, Isaac Buchanan had to go to court to get the child restored in the school. So in 2020, in a public institution, persons with locks are being kept out of getting an education. Then we have the Coral Gardens, which, which uh, assault upon Rastafari, which was legitimately done by decree of the head of state. So that Rastafari is still being persecuted under the, the, the colonial laws. And in terms of banks and institutions, you can't get employment. And one of the things that the Charter of Rights has now instituted is that you have what is called horizontal rights. In other words, it is not just a state that has an obligation to guarantee your rights, but private schools, these prep schools that do not allow locks children in their schools, are also in breach of the Constitution and the Charter of Rights since 2011, because you now have rights that you can enjoy, not between the state and yourself, but also the state and private institutions. So that is something that we must look at in terms of our colonial laws. Now we go to the question of how we protect those laws in the courts. And when we look to see that a person has to have money to be able to approach the court and pay a lawyer to, to establish their rights, that is another aspect, that there is no state assistance for you to pursue your rights. If you are sick, at least you can go to a clinic and you get some assistance. Under the British law, the whole question of preserving your fundamental rights, you have to pay for that out of your pockets so that we find that the poorer persons in Jamaica have not been able to settle those rights. We have also the question of the Privy Council, which is a colonial institution, which happens to be in the highest courts of Jamaica. For example, if we are going to pursue reparation, how can we go to the highest court, which is a British court, to seek within that framework our freedom, our compensation. And the Queen of England is the head of the Privy Council. So we cannot see, as it were, a British court headed by the Queen of England ruling against her. We have institutions like Queen's Council in Jamaica, where you take an oath that you will always serve and you will not take fees from the Queen of England and you will do no matters against her. So embedded in us, although we think we are independent, our constitution still has at the head of the three arms of government, the courts, the executive, and the parliament, the Queen of England still being over us. So that, that, knee, that knee that is imposed on our necks by the colonial, ex-colonial masters still continues to burden us in the legal system. And I therefore think that we should not be thinking that we are as liberated as we think we are because we are still under those vestiges of the colonial system. Laws have to be revisited. British trained lawyers do not think outside of the box. We do not think that there were laws which existed in Western Africa where we were taken from which protect family. For example, on the West African law, you don't have the concept of first cousins. First cousins are virtually brothers and sisters. And within the family group, the older sibling must account to the young, younger sibling for the treatment of children. The question of the child belongs to the village has now been tried to be reinstituted, which is an African principle, that the village is, is the one that grows the children. Now I see that we are trying to bring a law that if your neighbor is abusing your child, then you can intervene. That was always Africa. That was always the village in which we operated. So because we disrespect our own self and we have self-hate, we think that we didn't bring any good laws from Africa to Jamaica and none of our laws. And finally, on the question of Obia, which is a religious practice, we have a system where under the Jamaican law, before flogging was abolished about 15 years ago, when you are caught practicing Obia, you were whipped and in prison. It's one of the few things where you suffered to be with. Moderator, what my timing? <laughs> Am I going yes, 50? Um, yes, please go ahead. Okay, so under the OBIA laws, what we have in Jamaica is that it's one of the few offenses 
that you are whipped and sentenced and you can get as much as a year for practicing obia but also the person who goes to the obia man is can be in prison for six months and that person is also whipped and in prison and and also it is one of the first laws in jamaica where after you have served your sentence you come out under police supervision so a man who has been sentenced does time got whipped and comes out of prison the, the law allows the judge to pass a police supervision on you. Now, I have always said, we have been taught that OBIA is one of the most dangerous things. And look at it. People think that OBIA is worse than enslavement. I've always said, OBIA me, but don't enslave me. People actually under the Western interpretation of Christianity feel that OBIA is worse than slavery. So the white colonialists and the ens or enslavers taught us that when they enslaved us, it was quite good. What the worst thing could happen to us is that we are practicing Obi. And that is why we have pushed Haiti in a certain direction because of the practice of voodoo. And we feel that is the worst place to be. So that re-education about Obi and things like that, I think that it's time that we remove that law totally from the books so that we can liberate our people and people can understand that it comes out of african medicine and african spiritual beliefs and it is not what the colonial people did to us if they thought obia was so dangerous they would not seek to imprison us because they would be afraid of us it is because they don't like the fact that we had something to look to other than the religion they brought to us so that is my last talk my last talk is enslave me don't enslave me i prefer you obia me thank you so much bert um you know you have put into perspective landlessness citizenship claims to crown land and family the treatment of rastas the cutting of locks non-entry to lock children in public institutions access to education and even our own religious practice there are laws that have discriminated against jamaicans and continue to do so the courts, the executive and parliament, the colonial knee you're telling us is still on our necks. Some of us do know this, burdening our people in, in post-colonial Jamaica where the queen essentially remains one of the people's symbols. And that's what we're trying to remove. We can't continue to have the, the queen remain one of the people's symbols. Not when there has been so much oppression. So I want to thank you for your contribution, laying the perspective for us in the way that you have. Colleagues, our next speaker is Dr. Anna Ford Smith. The title of our presentation, Policing Memory, Policing the Nation. The case of Kingston's disappeared street murals. But let me say a little bit about um, Dr. Anna Ford Smith. She's a scholar, a theater worker, and poet. She was educated in Jamaica at St. Andrew High School. And after studying theater, began teaching at Edna Malley College for the Visual and Performing Arts, grounded in the arts. She researched, edited, and contributed in her adult years to Sistrin. Um, Sistrin's book, Lionheart Gal, Life Stories of Jamaican Women, published in 1986. She has a collection of poems, um, a number of published works. Among her many theater projects have been the collectively created Fallen Angel and The Devil Concubine, a dramatic adaptation of My Mother's Last Dance and Just Jazz, an adaptation of Jean Reese's Let Them Call It Jazz. Her most recent publication is Three Jamaican Plays, a post-colonial anthology, um, year 2010. And she is an associate professor in the Community Arts Practice Program under the Faculty of Environmental Studies at York University in Toronto. Anna, my friend and colleague, happy to have you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Okay, I, I have um, a PowerPoint and I just want to, I think what I do is I just um, hit Press share, share screen. screen. Yes. Okay, so when I'm ready, I'll do that. But I, I, as I'm speaking to you from Toronto, I thought I would update you on the, some of the struggles around the national symbols which are taking place here. Last weekend, Black Lives Matter organized a, a, a peaceful protest um, downtown in Toronto and in an artistic intervention, uh, splashed pink paint on, th on three or four statues. Uh, Edgerton Ryerson, 
who was the architect of um, Ryerson University is named after him, as you would know. Um, he, he was the architect of the residential school system and, um, and also a slave owner. And, um, and he uh, also founded Ryerson University. So he was number one. Number two was John A. MacDonald, who is sort of the grandfather of the Canadian nation of confederation. He, interestingly enough, has a, had a, um, a Jamaican connection in that his wife was, his father-in-law was a major slave owner in Jamaica. And, um, and so, you know, he was connected through his wife to enslavement in Jamaica. And the third one was Edward VII, which was a statue which was brought from India to Canada um, because the Indians didn't want it anymore um, because Edward VII had uh, presided over particularly brutal repression, so ended up in Canada. Uh, as a result, were imprisoned, uh, were arrested and imprisoned, and denied access to legal counsel for many hours. They were released and are out on bail now, but will be facing charges in the future. So the they'll be facing charges around September 30th. One of the people who has been arrested um, is certainly known to Blacker, it's Daniel Smith, who he might remember, who he probably remembers. And, um, and so I wanted to share that because she's of Caribbean descent. Um, she, she, she's a Barbadian and Jamaican origin. And um, so as I begin to speak about memorialization and um, national memory in, in Jamaica, I wanted to make the connection between the, uh, the colonial um, uh, process of memorialization here and uh, show the links, the transnational links be um, that exist between um, North America and the colonial um, systems of memorialization that have been established all over the globe. Um, now, having said that, I want to turn to my work on murals. Um, and just to put it in context, to begin by saying that all our national symbols are, in a sense, rooted in memorialization practices. Um, most national symbols work both as an impetus for action and an impetus for grief and memory. It is by turning our gaze to the horrors of the past that um, we find the courage and the strength to move forward. So in remembering Morant Bay, for example, we tell a story of the past which allows us to recreate collective bonds in the present. In societies like ours, which have been founded on genocide and enslavement, memory and mourning carry a particular importance because it is one of the few sites where in the long period of enslavement, people could express um, a, a form of, of knowledge based in memory that was excluded from dominant narratives. So things like dead yards, rites like wakes, like kumina and so on, became very important sites of national identity, very important spaces of cultural uh, memory, which um, were both sacred, but also um, were subject forming spaces in which people could begin to assert agency, agencies. Um, <clears throat> but um, in, in recent times, where emancipatory narratives have been set back and discredited, memory becomes in a sense, a repository for thinking about unfulfilled claims and subjugated identities. So thinking about what we want to remember, as well as thinking about what we are not allowed to remember, enable us to think through forms of justice in the present. And where, as in, the, as in the recent past, there is a sort of upsurge in forms of violence, 
often morning practices become somehow insufficient. Conventional morning practices begin, become somehow insufficient to express the accumulation of pain that people feel. Uh, and so new forms of mourning have to be invented. And I would argue that in Jamaica, the um, sort of for me, the inauguration of neoliberalism and the new forms of imperialism, which have arrived and been instituted on the back of old forms of uh, colonial, um, colonial knowledge that have never sort of been fully eroded, that these forms of neoliberalism were installed through a whole new wave of violence. And many people have written about the violent ways in which the neoliberal order has been installed in Jamaica. We, many people have spoken about the retreat of the state, the reformation of the state as a kind of traffic cop for transnational capital. We saw this performed very recently when you know the doors opened to tourism again in the height of the COVID, COVID pandemic because the, of the pressure of corporations to open the door to, to, so that tourism could be rekindled. So um, this, when, when this kind of violence happens, communities try to find ways to create their own forms of memory and to find ways to create uh, new, way, new ways of thinking about who they regard as heroes and who they want to remember. Now, I'm hoping I can, can you see this? No? So here we go. We're not seeing anything yet. Waiting. Can you see anything now? No. I think it it needs no. to share a window. I think we'll you have to select a window for sharing. Sorry. Where do I do that? The green, there should be a green screen at the bottom of your, at the tab at the bottom. And it's yeah. a share screen and it's a little, it's highlighted green with a box. If you press that. Share that screen, I have that. Mm -hmm. I've done that. Okay, you're probably not going to be able to do that, Honor, to share your screen. You sure? Um, I'm getting a message from our technical person, so... Um, Oh, okay. That's a bad. I'm not going to be able to share your screen. Oh, why? Okay. Your bandwidth is too low, is what I'm being told. Oh, okay. By our technical team. Oh, dear. Okay. Well, <clears throat> let me try to. I can't show you the images then, which is. Which, is, um, a which are the murals. Yes, they are the murals. So, um, so. <sighs> What I wanted to show you were some of the kind of images and aspirations that people express through the murals, which have existed in communities. Now, the pictures that I was going to show you no longer exist. They've been painted out. Um, they were painted out after, um, after Dudus. Um, they started to paint them out just before, but they painted them out over the period of 2010 into 2013. And now um, most of the murals, which I was going to show you, have been destroyed. The, um, the memory is essentially talk back to the dominant narrative of uh, of the criminal, which exists as a kind of ubiquitous figure in dominant nar um, narratives of, of the Jamaican state, I would argue. So um, we read about the criminal in the newspaper, and we, as we walk around, we hear, uh, we, we can pick up fragments of conversation in which uh, we, hear, um, we, we hear people speaking about a figure which is called who, who is roughly glossed as a, as a criminal. And the criminal is actually a shorthand um, for a kind of stereotype, a kind of old colonial stereotype in which um, uh, people who live in particular spaces are, um, are 
are seen as people who are amoral and lawless and who should be punished for what has taken place over the last 40 years. Uh, prior to this, Jamaica is imagined as a somewhat peaceful society, idyllic in many ways, and the word criminal becomes shorthand for the representation of a racialized and objectified category of beings who are discussed as if they have specific reductive characteristics that somehow erode their humanity. They come from particular spaces, they're from the ghetto, they, um, they are um, very geographically near to, to middle class sections of Kingston, but are nonetheless uh, um, as, as far away from those sections as you can imagine socially. Um, they must be avoided by the respectable and the better off because those who live there, um, uh, those who live in the ghetto come from down there, a kind of terminology that recalls Victorian metaphors for the genitals. Space in this formulation becomes race because those who are born in that geography are never phenotypically white, even though it is an open secret that many wealthy white and near white Jamaicans have made their money illegally. The criminal is nonetheless depicted as unlike them because he is phenotypically black with little access to formal systems of cultural authorization and forms of cultural capital that whiten or confer class respectability and this might include mastery of English, higher education and ownership of things. So the takeaway point from this is the fact that being born in a particular space automatically endows you with a predisposition toward criminality which is racialized and therefore to disposability because the criminal needs to be controlled, disciplined, violently if necessary, and, uh, and, um, if, uh, and increasingly uh, exterminated. So, you know, um, I can go into a long, a long discussion of where the origins of this narrative comes from, because this is a very old colonial narrative, which, can go, which we can trace right back to slavery. And the fact that it is still alive, in a way, is a, is a testament to the fact that colonial education has not disappeared. The murals which uh, exist in a way, talk back to this and create a counter narrative. These murals are in particular communities and they are largely of men, although there are some which are of women. There are several types of murals. One type um, celebrates community heroes. You would know um, those from, you can see, often see those on main road. So you would see um, images of pop icons like, uh, like Bob Marley, but particular icons that come from particular community. For example, Marcia Griffith, who comes from Hannah Town. Um, you can see Usain Bolt. You can see figures who have achieved um, fame. But you can also see community heroes who have somehow um, achieved particular things, such as completing university, or um, serving the community in some way. The ones which are the most controversial, and I'll skip to those right away, are the murals of the Dons, the Don murals. And these are the ones that have been painted out. And these also um, represent community heroes in an ambivalent way, often ambivalent way. So in some cases, the Don murals uh, present figures in go as godlike, as assuming kind of godlike proportions. And here I'm thinking of a mural of a guy called Zico, who um, was shot over about 10 years ago. And this mural has him standing with a dove on his shoulder. And behind him is an aura, a kind of religious aura, such as what you would see in a church where you would see a saint with an aura behind him, a blue aura. So here he is deified. And beside him is a psalm which says, please my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me, fight against those who fight against me. 
and this would be um, a kind of an appeal to a sacred order of justice which is able to transcend the materiality um, which uh, brought about the end of his life. So in a sense, this mural is expressing uh, an aspiration for the recognition of goodness. Um, a second, a second um, important element is the desire for respectability. So you would see often murals which demonstrate youth graduating from high school, wearing graduating um, a graduation gown and a hat, carrying a scroll, and in a sense this um, would, would echo sort of the Garveyite image uh, you will remember the image of Garvey uh, in which he appears wearing his gown and um, in full regalia as a scholar. These murals pick up on that image and kind of reproduce them. Um, then you have a sportsy theme, a theme in which, um, you know, a lot of the guys are represented as, as chilling out, but chilling out in a way uh, with the paraphernalia of the American um, sports canon. So uh, Michael Jordan kind of look um, in the past, uh, but you might also see them, you know, with a bottle of red stripe beer, as in the case of Dada, and with a spliff, um, and against the background of the community. So you would see the background of the community um, sort of being marked by the presence of the figure. Um, a, a final point I want to make about some of the murals is that they have a kind of transnational um, um, element in that in, in one of them, um, there's Murphy, AKA Papa Smurf, and he's shown kind of elevated in all in white, which as you know, has spiritual connotations, all in white, but sportsy again with, with uh, running shoes. And he's elevated above skyscraper, of above a skyscraper. And the skyscraper give you the sense of his being in New York. Uh, you can see him looking down on the American empire. And um, on either side, gangster for life, forever love, forever miss. He's an example of, uh, this is an example of a way in which he's seen as being both local and global, as extending um, his presence beyond uh, the island of Jamaica, rooted in the island of Jamaica, but from Jamaica to the world. So, um, so you begin to see transnational connections there, both in terms of content, but also in, and, and later on in other murals by other artists in terms of um, their connection to the graffiti culture of New York. So you, a guy like, um, like Cleaver Cunningham, paints very much in the style of, um, of the American graffiti artist. So you see um, this dialogue taking place between the African-American um, diaspora and uh, Jamaican inner city. I want to end with my last example, which is the example of um, Jason uh, Smith, who was murdered a long time ago now, and whose uh, mother painted a, a, a mural, a beautiful mural of him out, well, she didn't paint it, Howie painted it, the artist named Howie, who is from um, Spanish town and who um, works a lot in De La Vega City and who does a lot of work with dance hall, with murals in, in, um, in studios and so on. Jason's murals were painted uh, on the wall, but also on the car of his mother. So he was shot by the police when he was 15 and was found only to be, um, to be carrying a bag of chips and a bottle of water. And um, it was, uh, um, it doesn't seem to have been a targeted killing. It seems to have been an accident, um, but it, he is, you can't bring him back, he's dead. So his mother carried out a campaign for redress and part of her campaign included a visual expose of police brutality um, and commemorating her, her, her 
um, her son uh, through these images, uh, which called out police brutality. And um, she also had, the, had this painted on her car and she drove around Kingston with uh, images of her son um, on the car. These murals were all painted out. Some of them are Don murals, but not all of them are Don murals. They were all painted out in an effort to remark the space by the police. They painted out police blue. So all of this ephemera and this, um, this work, which attempted to express these aspirations within the community, were destroyed, obliterated. And um, in a sense, the killing of the of the person who, who had already been, been killed once was performed once more um, when the police killed um, the, uh, the figure that was, that was represented in the, um, in the mural. A lot more to say about that, but the point I want to leave with you is, uh, is a question, and it is, how and why do we allow colonial narratives to still so determine the culture of our memorialization that when popular murals and vernacular murals are produced and supported by the community, we feel uh, that it is the right of our police force to destroy these small acts of resistance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honor. You know, as you, you put for us the um, symbols and practices of memorializing among the people into perspective, particularly murals. I'm, I'm, re I'm really and truly noting the ways in which the presentation before on the laws that don't serve us get echoed by your own presentation. That laws like the vagrancy laws, the, the, the Obia law, there are so many ways in which um, we begin to, to, to stereotype the community heroes, the mainly black people of the folk, um, and branding them, profiling them as disposable, as criminal. The vagrancy laws are notorious. They are, they are open-ended. Um, the ways in which the police force can, in fact, use these mechanisms, apparatuses of the state, to, uh, to further oppress the people. So I, I, I want to thank you for your presentation because I, I think it follows quite nicely from the first one. Um, I want to turn our attention now to Mr. Owen Blacker Ellis. Everybody knows Blacker. Blacker is going to talk to us about inner city trials and triumphs, some of the untold stories and unseen symbols. But let me say a little bit about Blacker. He's a writer, educator, performing artist, well known over the last three decades for work as a comedic entertainer. He has worked all over the world as actor, musician, motivational speaker, workshop facilitator, and much more. He is a father. He has written scripts for stage, screen, television, published books of poetry. In fact, I was privileged to have introduced one of Blacker's um, uh, poetry launches. Um, so we go back a long, 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 long way. He's currently, of course, a senior lecturer in the School of Arts Management and Humanities at the Enemanic College of the Visual and Performing Arts and an adjunct lecturer at Trenchtown Polytechnic College. We're happy to have you. You are also setting your eyes wide on the PhD in Cultural Studies at the University of the West Indies in the Institute of Caribbean Studies. Over to you, Blacker. All right, greetings. I am very happy that Anna and um, Mr. Bergson came before me because they really dovetail nicely into what I want to talk about. The, the whole idea of land and landlessness and the murals um, on the walls of inner city quite nicely fit into what I want to say. So, um, so here's what I'm, I'm going to have 15 minutes and I have to tell so many stories that I'm not going to actually cover most of them. So I'm going to go straight into it. Donga Yard is a living museum. Yeah, Donga Yard is a living museum. The ghettos or garrison or inner city or whatever definition you choose to reference, the working class or suffering our communities of Kingston and urban St. Andrew or even urban Montego, the urban, urban St. James, 
are pieces that are really alive with untold stories. Untold stories that, among other things, speak to a kind of microcosm of Jamaica, a kind of an essential encapsulation of significant aspects of our country's personality, a kind of not so recognized symbol of our national character, you know, as a kind of a good, good, but bad, bad, little but talawa space. So I'm very interested, you know, this, the, the urban community, but what we call ghetto or inner city, how they symbolize the, the Jamaican personality of case study in contradiction on one hand and exemplar of binary bound division on the other hand. What I mean by that? Um, just like people speak of Jamaica, we can speak of the ghettos in that they somehow punch above their weight. They excel with limited resources, people there. Um, there we see evidence of genius and creativity and rich history, but poor people. That's the way the world very often sees Jamaica and we see ourselves. And that's very much the way how we see inner city community, or at least the way we from the ghetto see ourselves. And so that's the, that's the whole idea of the case study in contradiction. Why is a place that is so rich with potential so poor? Why is a place like Chenshon that is so, that is, that has given Jamaica so many legends and, and has, you know, the, the, this attraction to the world? Why is it still referred to and seen as one of the, the, the poorest and the most violent one places in Kingston? So that's the case study in contradiction that that is Jamaica, that is symbolized in the stories of the inner city. And then there's the, the binary bound division where you, you, you're either this or you're, or you're that. And, and that is Jamaica, and that is very clearly and starkly exemplified in the inner cities. I mean, every garrison is either PMP or GLP, and, and everybody there is either Gaza or Gully, or Dagat or Chickenhead, or Tugs or Friars, and there's this constant division across poles, you know, and so I'm very interested in that. I'm very interested in, in the untold story. If we, if we look at how um, cultural theorist Clifford Gears riffs on culture as the web of stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, then my question is who gets to tell our stories? Who gets to narrate the inner city stories? And so I'm very interested in how the inner city people are represented both in terms of how they are represented, as in shown to us over and over, but also in terms of how they are represented, both in terms of how they're represented in the local House of Parliament and in the global space of entertainment. Who gets to stand in our space as ghetto people? Who gets to represent us in Parliament? And very often, people who get that opportunity are invariably not of the inner city. So it's time we tell our stories. And there are so many untold stories. Now, now I'm, I speak of inner city largely and broadly, but I really want to zero in on my place, Chenshon, because that's where I come from, right? So, and, and I remember to, to tell a quick, well, refer to a story, because I won't tell the stories. I'll just reference the stories, because the time to tell the stories is not right now. They want to talk about the stories and, and reference them. So, so there's a Rasta man who was called um, Ras Daly, Anthony Bartholomew Daly, who, who in the early, early 70s, they, 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 they lived in a space where the only thing they bought from the shop was matches. They grew all their food. They went to catch water in a spring way over in New Haven behind Duane Park, and everything, everything that they ate, they, they, they grew themselves. They only buy matches from the shop. I remember the teenager arguing with the Rasta man about his doctrines and beliefs and so on. I remember him saying to me that the symbols of our two oppositional um, parties um, really, really symbolize how they deal with us. And he said, the V sign is two finger as you go And the clenched fist is a fist we are thumping down. And that is how we saw those symbols of the political parties. That's how we read them. So, so th those were, those were the unread that he was reading to me. Those same by that took out your eye and punch it down. Or, is, or in other words, two of them whole way. And I found it very interesting. But he also said to me that the alphabet as we know it wrong because it have A, B, C, 
then D, E, F, G, H, and I. And not that can be right because I come first. And everything happened because I see things on the airport. So be I see A, B, D, and the rest. And at first, then I thought, sure, guy the bone too much media. But as I grew older, I realized that, hey, he has something. Because the importance of the individual, the importance of the person and, and, and personal agency and everything happened because we see that's where I want to come back down to the personal. So I'm going to tell you a story about my trench zone, right? So there was a time when there was no Rima and Jungle. There was just one trench zone. You could, you could walk up West Road with your back to Panestone Road, Maypen Cemetery, and your face to the hills and walk up West Road crossing 14 streets, 1st Street to 14th Street. And you could turn out the roundabout there and go back down Collismith Drive, which runs parallel to, parallel to West Road, with your back to the mountain and your face to Maypen Cemetery and you see beyond it and you pass out 14 streets, right? And that, and, and that was for me like that, a very simple geography of my community. And I remember mornings, early mornings in like 72, when I just passed common entrance and going to high school outside to trench down, I would pass down West Road and see two brown skinned Rasta man jogging around the, the Vin Lawrence Park field in the early pre dawn. And those, the picture then meant nothing to me then as a young, as a youth. But now it is at a rich memory of those two, those two joggers were Bob Marley and Alan Phil Cole. And that was, that was my community. And, and if, we, if we look on the idea that in, in 74, Bob Marley in the song, Natty Dread, say, I walk up to first street, and then I walk up to second street to see. Then I try down to third street, and he stopped. He stopped the last line in that, in, in, in that was, I got to read seventh street, and that was 74. And by 76, it, it literally stopped there, because by 76, they had built a wall across, a coating scheme across West Road, and divided, trenched on the two, and it became, so everything from first to seven became Rima. And from 8 to 14 became jungle. And the cross at border meant war. So the, I'm making a case that in the same way how we accept that reparations are due to, to we who are descendants of the Africans who were enslaved for all that we have had to endure because of, because of that historical reality. Then, then there perhaps is a case for reparation to the inner city people Right, for all the ill that have been done to them through the, through the state apparatus that has created that division. 1975 New Year's Eve night, when folks were having countdown for the New Year in nice places uptown, my family was trying to survive because our house was firebombed on New Year's Eve 75, and we had to move out by dawn 76 because the youth who I grew up with were now paid to burn down the house because they were now having a purge, right, to, to create this division, Rima and Jungle, right? Who tells those stories? Who tell the stories of, of people like, like Ras Daly? Who te will tell the story of people like Curly Locks? Curly Locks was a Don in Trenchtown who slim Indian, high-pitched voice, unassuming, handsome, soft-spoken, don't look like any ragamuffin, but he wielded power. And when Curl Lock said, I can't I must clean up now, it's tidy up. He would walk around and check if puzzles are being kept tidy and think, who tells those stories? And those stories, if those stories get told, how, 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 how will we have a different vision of this place that is just seen as, as the ghetto? So I'm very interested in how, how the inner cities get represented and who gets to tell the stories of our people who gets to, to represent us um, on the world stage, um, who gets to provide access to Trenchtown to a, like a Beyonce and a Jay-Z, and how does the community get to benefit from that? And how the symbols that, that, we, that we have created for ourselves become red outside of the inner city. When a man yell up with a gun salute, and it is seen as inherently violent, Oh, the same thing is not said when we do government official gun salutes to honor heroes. Um, but if I use with them finger and go blam blam, it is seen as you know crude and rough and, and violent. How do we tell these stories? So that is my that's that's what I really am interested in. 
um, who, the, 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 the number of untold stories that reside in Trenchtown that, that are yet untold and if told by the people, because that's the key thing. If we get to tell our own stories, then, and that's why I'm really interested in documenting, and I have thousands, millions of kilobytes of, of interviews with people who will tell you that Trenchtown was this nice, wonderful place. Why so bad now? To a person, they say, blame it's the politicians. Blame, blame, the, blame the, the politicians who, who mash it up, right? Those are some of the untold stories. I sat on a sidewalk, and here a nice uptown gentleman tell you and you say, man is dead, the other man can live. And they create a division among the people. Those are among the untold stories. And, and that's you know, where I want us to look at how do we repay the people who have suffered, whose stories have are stories of, of trials, right? Who carve out triumph out of this, out of this existence of trials when it invariably in comes from the external elements outside the community. That was my time. Thank you so much, Blacko. Yeah. Your time was perfect. Okay. So there, so there are symbols and there are symbols and there are ghettos and there are ghettos. In fact, yes. the ones in Jamaica are indeed punching above their proverbial weight category. And there are many untold stories. And I want to say that, you know, there's nothing more for me to add. The fact is that the study, the case study in contradiction is left to be done by you, Blacker, and we yes. await the day when <laughs> we receive that thesis. Yes, yes, yes. So let me introduce to you now our next speaker, Dr. Yannick Hume. She's going to speak to us on imaging the sacred, vernacular symbols of spiritual presence and power. And she is a multifaceted scholar, priestess, dancer, choreographer, with extensive research expertise and specialization across the Americas and the African diaspora. As a tenured academic from the Caribbean with extensive regional and international experience, she has secured expertise and contribution to the Caribbean intellectual tradition, operating from disciplines such as cultural anthropology, cultural studies, and performance studies. Her research interests and teaching interests include religious and performance cultures of the African diaspora, Caribbean thought, popular culture, migration, and diasporic identities. She is multilingual, and her fieldwork experience in the sacred arts and African diaspora performance expressions are centered in the Caribbean and Latin America, um, especially Cuba, Haiti, Jamaica, Suriname, Brazil, and Colombia. There is so much more that I could say about her. She is a published academic, and she is a recipient of an, a number of grants, including the for, from the Ford Foundation and Wenigren Foundation for Anthropological Research. Yannick, we are pleased to have you with us and look forward to your presentation. Hello, good evening. Thank you all. Um, thank you for this incredible occasion to join in company with you and to share a bit of, uh, of um, my work into the sacred and to, uh, it's wonderful to see the kind of trajectory of thought that has been part of the conversation so far and to, um, to continue that line of inquiry in terms of unearthing, excavating and bringing to presence some more of the marginal, more marginal or invisible symbols or those that we, we seldom uh, spend time pondering. Uh, today, I want to, I've shifted the title a little bit, just slightly, in, in, as opposed to imaging, I've used envisioning the sacred now, and I'll, I'll share the screen just, just now. But the idea of how do we begin to understand um, the diverse religiosity of the Caribbean, and specifically of Jamaica, and what are the symbols, the vernacular symbols, um, that have come to represent this, this rather wide and diverse world. And it's, it's interesting that on this occasion of the birth of His Imperial Majesty, that I am opting to shift the gaze a little bit from the normative patriarchal dominance of imaging religious power and presence and sacrality to women who have really um, been at the center 
of a lot of what we would call our indigenous, our folk, and our Afro-Caribbean sacred expressions. And so in envisioning, I want to begin to look at what are some of the, the symbols that are often um, not rendered visible because not all eyes could see them, because they're not meant to be decoded by those who, oops, they're not meant to be decoded by those who don't have the religious knowledge to see, yeah? Uh, when I was thinking about putting together this, this, uh, this presentation, I went immediately to that kind of um, almost gut reaction of saying, okay, what are these symbols in terms of religion in Jamaica and so forth? And I went to Bedwood and Kapo and Garvey, and um, you could kind of trace that, that uh, very strong nationalist and patriarchal um, symbology that surrounds what Jamaican strength, nationhood, heroism, and religion looks like. And especially when we're looking at a kind of um, Afro-Christian or Judeo-Christian uh, traditions that are cloaked within an Africanity, even though still remain um, the images that come to us, still remains those that are um, part of a wider um, masculinist aesthetic, right? Whether it is in the imaging of the robe that we find in um, from the early days of Bedwardism, the robe that is used, the the um, the robe that is used by Capo, and when we trace that to Boba Shanti robes as well, and the robes that are used within Rastafari, when we look at the staff that is used, um, while either in revivalism or revival rather, and what we see in Rastafari as the staff, the baton, the baston. And I wanted to see and begin to look through what are some of the other things that we use in, in our traditions. And oftentimes when we think about the realm of the sacred in Jamaica, it's, it's, often, quote, it's often these um, objects that we might not deem otherwise sacred. But when they're placed together in unison with other objects, and in the context of a, spe of a specificity of a particular um, religious observation or, or spiritual observation, they get imbued with the sacred. And so a bottle no longer becomes a bottle or a kitchen bitch no longer becomes just a flame in a tin. It, it references something else or a glass of water on someone's head no longer is just a glass of water. So I wanna share my screen hopefully, yes, and begin to explore some of what I'm speaking of specifically through the images. And are you seeing that okay? Yeah. Yes, perfect. Okay. So on, um, I, I open with two revered and deceased uh, uh, queen mothers, queen mothers, mother queens, those women who were divinely ordained to rule within the system of Kumina, the religious system of Kumina. And if you look closely on their heads, you will see objects that are quotidian in their use and may be seen as something quite odd to have on the head, but what it represents in terms of their ability to balance divine power. And my interest um, in engaging Kumana primarily in my discussion this, this, this evening is to emphasize that even with the very strong masculinist aesthetic that, that dominates some of the national symbols around Jamaica's religious radicalism and spiritual power and presence, you also have this very strong divine feminine presence that balanced out this otherwise um, strong masculinist presence, you had this other energy that also held the bottom. And some might say held the top as well. Uh, you have um, the late Miss Queenie, Amma Jean Kennedy, and Mother Bird on the, on the left, on the white. 
in Mother Bernice, I believe Miss Queenie would have passed in 1998, if I'm not mistaken, and Mother Bernice would have transitioned in 2014. Both of these women, Bantu women descendants, Congo women, Bakongo women, women who were the repositories of Congo knowledge and tradition, as in most of the traditions of, of, the, of the clans of Kumina families found in St. Thomas and extending into St. Catherine and parts of Portland, these women held the, the mysteries, the memories, and the practice, as Mother Bernice would say in our belly button, and also in their embodied engagement with the sacred. And water and fire become two main elements, symbols of which they did the most impressive work within the repertoire of their divine sciences. Congo people know that water is the, the first, the last, and the most if, uh, efficacious medicine. It is, it is the way in which the realm of the invisible becomes visible. And it's the way in which those who have transitioned from this earthly plane and this realm of material existence make their transition across what is known as the Kalunga line to the other, the other side, the other side of existence. And what you have in this uh, stature of Miss Queenie is her balancing effortlessly, effortlessly something she did um, not just for posing for photographs, but in the midst of practice, in the midst of her service and serving the divine ancestral energies of the Kumina um, pantheon. You find her balancing this water that captures all of these memories, because we know the ocean was the first cemetery, and it was the first spaces of which the contact between the continent and the Americas was able to be established. And in her movement, in the circular movements of the dance of which we wrongly reduced Kumina to, um, but in the circular movement of, the, of the, the structure of the ritual itself, water is one of the consistent elements and it is to be balanced and used and manipulated with care. And on the same, at the same level, we also have the kitchen bitch, the, the, the tin with the kerosene, filled with kerosene and the wick and that light, because where there is water, there must also be light in order to lead our ancestral kin out of the darkness, lead the spirits who are um, elevating, who are entering a realm of ele elevation to be seen and for us um, mortal beings to also see them. And so we have with Mother Bernice balancing this light and she's bound, as you see around her waist, she was known to tie or bind her waist fully because among the Congo people, it is at the site of the umbilical cord that we find the sacred Yawa, which I'll get into. It is the site, the, the space of which we connect our human materiality with our celestial spirituality, where the, where the two realms of existence, the living and the dead come together at the, at the seat of our navel. And so that is one of the, the most um, powerful sites of the body, a symbol of divine power and strength, but also it's one of the most um, uh, vulnerable sites of the body as well. And for the Kumana people, it is a site of which is wrapped and tied and bound so that the energies remain seated and grounded in the center of the officiant, the center of the, the body generally of a woman. What we often um, see within a kind, this is a composition of images that were taken from a 2000 and, oh, 2005 exhibition, if I'm not mistaken, at the um, Ethnographic Museum of the Institute of Jamaica, of which I was a co-curator of working there at the time. And there are some images that we might, that might come to mind that we could relate to as symbols of 
the sacred of spirituality, of religion, of presence, of power. We have this chalice, I believe it's a 1680-something chalice that is in the um, collection. We have, um, that might be the most obvious and what I think the majority of the Jamaican public may go to as a symbol of, uh, of, of, of a particular religious terrain of Jamaica. But when we look at the composition of these other images, and if we had time for a quiz, it would be interesting to see what people would be able to define and see and be able to and declare as being a symbol that represents spirit and that represents power. Um, one might be, uh, there are two, well, three very strong revival imagery that we find here. We have, you know, that of the baptism in living water, but one of the symbols that were part of this, the enslaved past and something that if you drive around certain parts of Jamaica and most notably St. Elizabeth and St. Anne, uh, you would come across the flags, the flags that help to demarcate sacred space. In an earlier period, these same flags, when I say earlier in a period of enslavement, these flags would demarcate spaces of healing centers known as bomb yards on bamboo sticks with white or red flags with a cross. Here it's symbolizing a revival center, this one particularly here in Wattstown. But you have these images that when the enslaved were in working in the fields and, and moving or tra traversing across plantations or working their own grounds, to be able to know that the space over yonder is a space they could go for healing, a space that was a center of the highest of sciences, which we like to call in a diminutive way, obia, but a space of the highest divine sciences for healing. When they saw that flag, they knew that this flag, this, this site would be a site that they could go to for healing. And this, this symbol became a very powerful symbol to identify a space where uh, a kind of religious reckoning could happen, a recognition of, a, of, a, of a, a memory of something past, but also the very real reality of having a site where they could go and be bathed and receive um, information through mediums and also to be given herbs of which they could take either ingest or used on their bodies to do the kind of curative therapeutic work, therapeutic work that we tend not to assign to obia, which is one of its main engines. Um, and also to other African derived practices that are, that have at their heart and at their center, the, the demand, the, the, the kind of thrust of curing, the therapeutic and curative power of the divine sciences is what is that, is that um, encapsulated in some of the symbols here assigned to this flag. Um, and those who are able to decode the colors of the flags will know what kind of work happens in such a space. In the middle, the more prominent, the most prominent image is that of a table. And for those who observe the traditional mourning practices still in uh, very rich in Jamaica, coming from a line of grave diggers who, um, who understood the power of ensuring that one's journey home was, was um, well orchestrated. Um, they knew that certain things had to be at the presence, in the presence of the home, including your book of Sankeys, some may include an Old Testament, but um, with these books, these, these, these important texts, were also items that we would find in our kitchen cupboard. Salt, sugar, lime, white rum, sugar and water, plain water. So the table was incomplete if you didn't have these items also present in order to shepherd whatever energies through the space, spiritual energies through the space. We all know that we don't like salt. And you call sweet ones with sugar. You mix, you make a sweetie longo to call the Bantu spirits to join you. 
And these things, you use lime to cut bad energy. Somebody come in with a crosses and you use the lime to cut through it. Underneath the table will be two machettes, two cutlers cross to cut the energies. So those who are able to decode these things would see that the place well aligned, to see that you can't just come in and romp with the people in because the place is anchored in, just in with something stronger. It's anchored because it's using these elements and unifying the space to bring a certain energy to the particular space. We have seals within revival, seals where you have a combination, with seals could be seen as these, these, um, these uh, spaces of con concentrated, consecrated energies that help to focus the divine power of a particular moment. Here you would have um, just to the right of the table with uh, different stones in an enamel basin with medicinal herbs around it. And depending on where it's placed and how it's used, we can understand what is the presence it's trying to evo invoke or ward off. Then we have the kumina drum, right? Without it, with, that is unskinned. It's just a shell here. And we have a, a strong tradition in Conca, St. Elizabeth of the, the Jankunu tradition that's linked to the burial mourning traditions of, of feasting one's ancestors in the family plot where the Jankunu headdress and Bilby, can, Bilby writes on this in a, in a beautiful piece where he goes through kind of the history of Jankunu in Jamaica from its more sacred understandings. And so we have that, the, uh, 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 an image of this headdress that will be disbanded after the ceremony is held. So I spoke about the sacred Yawa, the Kong Kongo cosmogram, the idea of having um, the center of the body and everything that goes around it. And a series of images I want to share with you um, all puts this in action. It puts this as an embodied, active engagement with the sacred. Um, we have this notion of the four moments of the sun, how the sea itself, the, Kalunga, the Kalunga line, divides the world into two parts of the living and the dead. The two, of course, are not diametrically opposed. They actually are part of a symbiotic relationship. So if we just keep that cosmogram in your head and see this is um, Lita Mars's Jessamine Garden, West Kingston, and you could see how even in, within the context of a revival service, unfortunately you can't see the full scope of the circle, but it's a full circle with the, all the seals and altars placed on the ground. And um, the manipulation of sacred objects that, and the constellation of these, these quotidian objects, whether it's DNG bottle soft drink, and the combination of the colors of those soft drinks with candles and fruits and imbuing those spaces with consecrated and, uh, consecrated and concentrated energies of the sacred. We have also in the marking or demarcating of sacred space at the start of a Kumina ceremony, um, this was on Harbor Road, an uh, impromptu altar that was erected again a center post where the altar or the seal here functions as the center and then everything happens around it, the movement that happens. It is demarcated um, beautifully with honey. So honey is a final kind of what holds that embraces the energy in the center. And it's things like fruits, bougainvillea that they went out and, and, and picked in that moment because they realized Kumana needed to happen and they needed to demarcate the space that was going to be um, the center of the action. We have here also this idea of a, this is a earlier 1968 uh, photo of a Kumana, 1968 photo of a Kumana held with young people in the center holding that center space and then the circumference of that center being filled with community members um, listening and taking part in the presentation. And you have this energy of this notion of the worlds being um, the world of the living and the, and the world of the dead coexisting 
and being called upon and pulled upon and apart in a synergistic way. And the idea of, of death and mourning is very important for um, a lot of my work, and I'm really excited to see uh, and hear of Honor's work with the murals and the various ways in which um, we have always found um, a, a means to remember and to mourn publicly. And one of our richest traditions that are filled with folk symbology is around death. And whether any, you don't have to go far to see it. You just have to drive across Jamaica and you are, you are inundated with these images, images of the deceased and, the, and their final resting place. These are images from family plots in Manchester and Clarendon. And you don't have to go far to see it, right? And where, you know, this one on the, the left who has tombs that go back to the 1860s. It's my family plot, family land in Manchester, in Chantilly. And the ways in which we, we have always created these spaces to anchor and to give visibility and a constant reminder that we come from somewhere and from somebody that we are while our existence to, on this plane may have been ushered in by sea, we anchor the memories who've, of those who've gone on in the land. And we make sure that we see them when we traverse the landscape, that they're always with us, that they're always part of our histories, always part of our memories, always part of the ways in which we conceive ourselves as yadis, right? And I'll close with two images of Kumana again, where you have the, the, the symbols of the, the drum being a centerpiece in, in this, it, to activate these energies, to bring these energies to the center, and movement, and the ways in which this, cosmo, this Congo cosmogram activates and animates a lot of our existence, where even for those who may not hold on to a Kumana legacy, you would still see how you have the casket could, could, could function as a sacred center post of which the mourning, uh, the, those who are mourning, the living who are mourning can dance around in that divine circle, in that divine circle that ushers us back to the beginning and also propels us into our future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yannick. If we were never aware, there are symbols for invocation, protection, communication, travel, honor, and veneration. These are the people's symbols. And I like the fact that you began with honoring the feminine energies through spiritual leaders of Kumina um, and other traditions. And, and there are symbols, even though um, we, we know dominantly we have masculine symbols that these feminine energies and um spiritual leaders can be contrasted with but you found for us and located the balance with which these um feminine energies and symbols um function with masculine symbols as well mm -hmm. so the realm of the sacred in jamaica very important very very important and i really want to thank you for that presentation our next speaker is Dahlia Harris, um, speaking about Miss Lou's method from folklore to mass media, back to our focus, right squarely, um, our focus on the people's symbols. Um, Dahlia Harris is CEO of DMH Productions Limited. She, I call her a polymath. She has steadily made her mark as a writer, actress, producer, director, mounting several award-winning and critically acclaimed theatrical and television productions. Among them is Jamaica's number one television drama, Ring Games. Dahlia has been a media practitioner for over 25 years, working in print, radio, television, and we wonder, well, when do you sleep, Dahlia? She's currently a television host on Smile Jamaica, It's Morning Time, and also radio program, Two Live Crew on Radio Jamaica 94 FM. She's a first class honors graduate from our very own University of the West Indies with a double major in English and Media and Communications. I want to welcome you, Dahlia, 
and ask you now to make your presentation. Thank you very much, Sonia. <laughs> um, first of all, it's a pleasure for me to be here and, and this evening as we talk about national symbols. Um, I, I want to define from my perspective, they say national symbols intend to unite people by creating visual, verbal, or iconic representations of the national people, their values, their goals, or their history. Um, the symbols are supposed to be designed to be inclusive and representative of all the people of the national community. So when we talk about folklore and, and folk language, um, folklore is defined as the traditional beliefs, customs, and stories of a community passed through the generations by word of mouth. So, so what better way to unite a people or to represent their goals or values but through folklore? Huh? So national language serves as a symbol and expression of the national identity of, of a country. It's part of a nation and a person's heritage. And it fulfills an important function in that it provides a country with a means of communication among its citizens. And it's essential if the citizens are to develop a common feeling of ethnic solidarity and a sense of national purpose. So ideally, it should be the preferred source of communication at every level. But everyone knows when we talk about language, it becomes a very sensitive issue. So sociolinguistic history suggests that among its determining factors, a designated language and a, <laughs> must have prestige over the other rival languages, usually a result of the prestige of its speakers as well as the place where it's spoken. It must be spoken and accepted by the majority of the citizens of the country. So you wonder when you put prestige and majority, how do we get these two things together? And that happens through firm guidance of government and the aid of mass media. So it also says language must be in possession of great literature. And that's where I want to start. Must be in position of great literature. So literature is defined um, mainly as a body or collection of written work and more restrictively it refers to writing considered to be an art form or any single writing deemed to have artistic or intellectual value. So in Jamaica, where our heritage rests so much in oral traditions, how do we come to a place where we see the national language as being patwa or as being how we speak generally um, if we are saying that it must be something that is a written work. So what, two of the things I want to do this evening is to, to look at the ways in which Miss Lou contests the idea of national language being something that's just prestigious or spoken by the elite and, and also how she critiques um, the national symbols themselves. And I want to start with a little history. I mean, I won't go very far, but in terms of radio, you know that um, we were characterized by a definite British slant. Radio Jamaica being one of the earliest stations was owned by a subsidiary of the British Rediffusion Group and was originally broadcast in a BBC-like format. Um, eventually, they saw an increase in more authentic Jamaican programming, and that would include Miss Lou's Views, of which I'll speak this evening, a series of radio monologues produced by the Honorable Lou from 1965 to 1982. And that's significant because on the heels of independence in 1962, a lot of the national dialogue and conversation and a lot of what um, would have been engaging the public in mass media is this sense of national identity. Who are we as Jamaicans? Um, what are we trying to achieve? What does this motto mean and our national symbols? And she was a big part of that discussion. So the movement of folk media into the mass media format and the way it facilitates the movement of community approaches into national discourse is a significant feature of Miss Lou's views. When we talk about folk media, um, Alice Koseteng says, it's communication forms that are familiar to and accepted by common people for the purpose of entertaining, informing, enlightening, instructing, and educating. 
Um, the ones used in this series include songs, drama, poetry, proverbs, and storytelling. So stories and songs that would normally be shared in specific village gatherings um, were now accessible to communities nationally. So you would then be a community in St. Catherine and the ways of, of sharing your histories and your values would be as a small community amongst yourselves. But with Miss Luna moving that dialogue into mass media, then it became communities across Jamaica sharing these stories and these ideas and these values. So in reinforcing the voice of the working class, Miss Lou encouraged them to become actively involved in national dialogue regarding issues of relevance to them. So, so this national language um, would now no longer be out of the reach of the working class. They, they were allowed to interact and to contribute effectively because it provided accessibility to complex civil topics by facilitating the interpretation of the complex issues as they are translated to identifiable words and phrases and folk forms. Um, to take a phrase from Auntie Rochi, it can boil down the whole cascas to pot bottom with a few ordinary words. So in class and color debate, which is one of the, the, the episodes of the series, she says the educated gentleman them was a boss whole heap of big word about distinction and discrimination and preconceived motion and equality and superiority and all of them highfalutin sounding sinting there. Um, but she explores the issues through phrasing such as some somebody clap them guy pan a black somebody, them start class them as low class. And plenty somebody no respect no black somebody at first sight which Abdi describes the color hierarchy in Jamaica. At first sight, of course, suggesting that the, the foremost criterion used to determine a person's class is their skin color. So the judgment of, of class through color is only adjusted if the subject is found to have high education or then get big job or political vacative or big motor care. And she suggests it's an adjustment that black Jamaicans struggle to achieve. So who can't afford big motor car? They pan a strain them pocket for buy big motor car for get themselves class elevation. The words can and strain, of course, emphasizing the difficulty of their attempts. So the realities of colorism and its effect on behavior become more explicit to the audience through the use of their nation language, which is Patois. Part of the accessibility also includes the addition of the voice of the ordinary man to national dialogue. So characters are drawn from all classes and social hierarchy. So she breaks down levels of prejudice and barriers to acceptance through parasocial or, or pseudo relationships. And the language contributes to this process. For as a language of the working class, it helps to guide audience perceptions of characters, situations, and of themselves. So audience can readily identify with messengers and characters through naming. So instead of a proper noun, um, she uses a number of determinants, which is a, a folk tradition in the Caribbean, not just in Jamaica. So she's describing people based on their occupation, their characteristics, their personality, their lifestyle, social standing, um, or their title is used to identify the social actors in the program. So characters are described as the Krumujin gyal, the Fufuul gyal, and Leodong. And when you hear Leodong, you can imagine all he does all day is just Leodong doing nothing. She said Leodong is a no worker. Um, so again, this is in keeping with the Jamaican tradition of using the language to rename and to nickname. The use of a distinct trait about an individual um, reflected in a title. So similarly, they're able to understand the context when social actors are defined by words such as big, in big and high for looting, I'm a big job, or low class. So audiences who are already appreciative of this form of discursive construction um, are able to understand the context of the names as they're describing their own language. 
and may apply the desired meaning. So the levels of interaction and discourse also become subverted in the way she uses language, as listeners are able to voice their opinions in a manner which ordinarily would not be facilitated. So class and color debate, for instance, um, the big highfalutin people um, debating at the church hall suggests that the debate about class and color is restricted to formal discourse. Um, academics are the ones who are talking about it in church halls. And this type of, of formal prestigious discourse is often what is most respected and recognized as valid. Though the issue is being discussed in everyday interaction amongst ordinary Jamaicans. So, but, but because the interaction is in an informal mode, it, it's really recognized for its importance. So she inserts that interaction to the inclusion of numerous characters by broadening the perspective of the issue and also um, just in the way the language is used and the stories that she tells. So there's a story of her going to an office and the young man sees her. So she asks to speak to the manager. But because I'm looking at her, he can he say, manager can't speak to somebody like you. But then when the manager comes, he says, wait, it looked like she high. And so just the way in which the language describes what takes place breaks down the issue from being just a macro issue to a micro issue and how it affects people every day. So she also uses it, as I say, to critique the national symbols. And I'm going to show you how she does it with a coat of arms. Um, so, you know, the Jamaican national motto of many one people um, is represented on the coat of arms. It shows a male and female member of the Taino tribe standing on either side of a shield, which bears a red cross with five golden pineapples. The crest shows a Jamaican crocodile mounted on the royal helmet of the British monarchy and mantling. Um, the existing coat of arms was granted to Jamaica in 1661 and was partially revised in 1957. So in this episode, she goes to the community and through their own language, allows them to give their own impressions of the coat of arms. And I'll read it for you. It says, one big cascas broke out in an anti roachy yard about coat of arms changing, you see? Mm -hmm. The girl dim dim said that she had to draw one big pot full of rice and peas and send it to a coat of arms competition. And she must win the competition. For from Sheban, she hear fear her grandma that prays rice and peas as Jamaica coat of arms. And she don't know who make them want to come change it now. The woman them call much is soccer teeth and holler ignorance. And the rice and peas them want to change and the rightful coat of arms where they pan all our money them and we passport them and we stamp them. And did a little girl pimp him holla and we police uniform button them and we soldier uniform button them and we school book them. Please note where those national symbols are. And same time, all the picnic them in the yard start jump up and clap them and an Allah. Change or no change No change it, then yes, I change it. And a boxy kaisi coat of arms. And you watch it stand for foot and get out. Uno stop it. Have manners and respect. We coat of arms no change yet, so no take no liberty with it. Man no dead, no call him doppy. For over 300 years, that coat of arms depend and represent Jamaica all over the world. It served very long and good and distantly. And the Arawak man and woman pan with coat of arms was the first Jamaicans that inherit the land. They missed with each right to represent you upon the coat of arms. Couldn't say, brother, we the all have roots, man of roots. But Tata once stump jam him stick a grung and gill out. No more Arawak no dear Jamaica, then dead out. So I don't want to back a time coat of arms. We have to change it. And to rush it to your tire up and Tata and say, then you're going to change the name of your country, Tata. The name Jamaica comes from Arawak language, you know. So you're going to change Jamaica to Bugo Yaga. Tata make up him face and grind him teeth and say, now make a root to you today, you hear Miss Rochi? What about we African heritage and we black somebody them what fight for we independence? What about change to them? And the conversation goes on and on. Miss Lou then places both levels of interaction in a single discourse. So through mass media, she places the nation language 
and the prestigious language in a single space, the formal and the informal, um, underscoring the value of both levels to national dialogue. The programs also offer that government uses the media to address the people. So through free education, say listen up, one did read the big headline in a newspaper yesterday where say education to be free. Last missus, my auntie Rochi, she jumped for giant Allah. Time never too long for Barnabas grow a bean. Now in the 1960s, one of the reasons they thought radio was more relevant than print media was because they thought more people, less people could read. And so listening would be a better means. So when the government addresses the people through newspaper, that in itself tells you that some of the citizens are excluded from this national dialogue. So Miss Lou uses songs and rhymes to bring out the importance of the things that government has, <laughs> has um, <laughs> said to the people. I'll give you an example. I see Dr. Dyer. Me pull up my purse with money, them teeth it were from me. Me full up my belly with food, and as me sneeze, me feel hungry. Me full up my brain with learning, with sense and knowledge, grand. Me feel relief, not a teeth can teeth, me education. So really, the rhyming and the songs coax the audience into not just listening to dialogue, but tells them that as audience, you have to participate through your own language. So um, I'll wrap up because I know we're all short on time, but Stuart Hall offers that linguistically generated meanings help set the rules, norms, and conventions by which social life is ordered and governed. Hence, language is not just passive, but it actually helps to shape society, how we see ourselves, how we interact with, with others, and how we conform to social rules and norms. So, so language as a national symbol um, effectively has to represent the people and has to be something that the people can access. Those are my 15 minutes. Thank you very, very much, Dahlia. Oh my gosh, the brilliance of the subversion in Miss Lou's work was way before its time, but it is time to really place Miss Lou's work in perspective. And I'm really so happy that you've been doing this work to remind us of the role of national symbols the role of folk traditions and the role of language in particular through the enormous work of Miss Lou and the many characters that she embodied. So I want to thank you for that. Keep doing what you're doing. Our, our final, but by no means least, um, the speaker, Dr. Jake Homayak, speaking to us quite in honor of the 128th Earth Strong of His Imperial Majesty. He's talking today about highly... Rastafari, hail Rastafari, contending symbols of nationhood in the Jamaican post-colony. But let me say a few words about um, Jake Homayak. He is a cultural anthropologist who received his doctorate from ba Brandeis University in 1985, recently retired following a 34-year career in the Department of Anthropology at the Smithsonian Institution. Jake began fieldwork in Jamaica in 1980 among members of the House of Nyabingi and has had a sustained relationship with the Rastafari community since that time. In 1988, 89, and 91, he assisted delegations of Rastafari elders to travel to the United States to participate in forums and programs designed to educate the public about the liberty and spirituality of Rastafari. Rastafari, of course, remains one of the important symbols of the people of Jamaica. And in 2007, he took this very seriously and curated the exhibition Discovering Rastafari 2007 to 2011 in the African Voices Hall of the Smithsonian's National Museum of, of Natural History. He's the author of various publications, many articles, and co-author of the forthcoming book, Enter the Lion, the State Visit of Emperor Haile Selassie to the Caribbean. 1966, which is forthcoming. Jake, nobody else could have taken your place on this forum to speak to us on this matter. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Sonia. It is my distinct honor and pleasure to be here on the 128th Earth Strong of His Imperial Majesty. Just let me hail up my brethren and sistren Yes, blessings on this day to one and all. 
So, you know, when I evolved the title for this, um, Hail Rastafari, Contending Symbols of Nationhood in the, post, in the Jamaican Post Colony, I wasn't thinking about Jamaica, the Rastafari Jamaican Brethren and Sistren. I was thinking about His Imperial Majesty, Rastafari, King Rastafari. And what I, what I argued in this, the, the kind of praise of the argument here is that through the work of the Rastafari movement, even during the colonial period, that Rastafari has been a presence in Jamaica from that very time. That, and that the visit of His Majesty to Jamaica in 1966 was a profoundly transformative moment for not only the Rastafari community and movement, but for the Jamaican people. And that the aftermath, the energies that were released by that visit were such that it led ultimately to what we think of today as the blackening of Jamaica. It also released the artistic talents of Rastafari brethren and sisters such that the presence of the emperor is now seen everywhere in Jamaica. So I do have a PowerPoint, but I have to say I've gone through this several times since this afternoon, and I, I in fact know that I won't get through this in time if I attempt to hit all the um, you know, if I to go through the whole thing, uh, where's my little button over here that's kind of kind of jammed up where I actually launch this thing? No, that's not it. In any event, um, I can't do it that way. No, oh, come on. Perhaps just select each slide on the left. It won't, it won't, uh, okay, that does it, that does it. So, so I'm actually going to jump over some of these, these early slides here because these were speaking to the fact that, that the, the quote-unquote presence that His Majesty has had in Jamaica all the way from the early 1930s in the colonial period come from the emergence of a Rastafari visual culture that focused on collecting, displaying, circulating, and interpreting images of His Majesty. Those images became surrogates for His Majesty. Uh, these, the, the picture you're looking at here are, are the postcard size images distributed by Leonard Howell, um, which ultimately were, were talked much about in his trial for sedition. Here is a photograph, 1953, taken by George Simpson of another of Howe's contemporaries, Joseph Nathaniel Hibbert in Jonestown in his yard, in which Hibbert makes his body a canvas to identify with his majesty. And this has been a practice that we've seen over the years with Rastafari. The photo on the right, of course, is the National Geographic photo. Uh, even the Gleaner participated in this uh, visual culture in a uh, January 1936 article about His Majesty seated with the picture of him seated on his white charger. Um, the article is penned, according to the, the, the paper, by someone who knew him, suggesting it might have actually been penned by an Ethiopian, but it laid out um, his statesmanship his progressive attitudes, and the, the challenges that he would face in maintaining the sovereignty of Ethiopia. And of course, on the left, the voice of Ethiopia, which was the Ethiopian World Federation's paper that circulated at the same time. By, the, by 1937 or 38, they're actually locals um, in Jamaica. This, this page on the left is a page from the scrapbook, a Jamaican the scrapbook of a Jamaican Rastafari known only as Brother John, who collected papers from England, Ireland, and the United States 
covering the Italo-Ethiopian War. I'm not going to dwell too much on these because, as I said, I'll never get through them. Uh, perhaps if there was one context in which these, these images of His Majesty were, were, had, a, had a profound effect was in the street meetings, in the Rastafari street meetings that, that probably began sometime around the mid-1930s and lasted into the mid-1950s. And here again is a, a photograph by George Simpson taken in Trenchtown, um, and we see the photograph of His Majesty standing on the unexploded Italian, Italian bomb, um, a coronation picture in the background. We actually know the name of this brother here, Brother Downer, who uh, had, a, had a yard in Trenchtown. But, but I really want to shift to talking about the impact of the visit of His Majesty, and, and because it's there that, there that the major impact of the emperor as a symbol in Jamaican nationhood is made. And what I would say is, um, thinking about what, what Rex Nettleford said about the visit, uh, pointing out that the, the enthusiastic reception that was given to the emperor was such that it only rightly belonged to, to someone, a Jamaican leader, who would normally be considered the embodiment of Jamaican nationalism. It was shortly after that that a member of, Jamaican, of the Jamaican parliament, Ken Hill, I believe, um, actually uh, made a motion to replace the Queen of England with Hale Selassie as the formal head of state. And all of this kind of spoke to the fact that, that the visit of the emperor um, cut against all the ways in which the, the, the British colonial state had told Jamaicans, had told black people, not only in Jamaica, but of course elsewhere, that there was nothing of value in, the, in Africa, there was nothing of value in the African heritage, and that the African continent had nothing to offer for the future of their society. Um, much has been made uh, about the fact that that the impact that the emperor had on the Jamaican people devolved from the, the, his royal bearing, his dignity, and the calm demeanor with which he enacted the role of emperor before them as he spent three and a half days in Jamaica. But I would submit, while there's, while there's clearly something to that, I would submit to you that there's a kind of there was a kind of spiritual and even cultural alchemy at work that made that impact something greater, that actually, that actually constituted a break with the ordinary reality. Um, it wasn't only the dismissal of the formal state honoring at Palisados, but it, but it broke with the ordinary reality and was important of things to come. And that was the, the virtually mythic way in which events at Palisades unfolded. Now, in the book that you mentioned, Enter the Lion, uh, which is about the state visit of His Majesty to the Caribbean, uh, the major part of that book is, in fact, focused on Jamaica. We have 55 testimonies in the book, and just for, for planning off the details of individual testimonies, the kinds of formulaic things are that are remembered that moment at Palisades go like this. Routinely, it's recalled that a flock of white doves burst through the clouds as if to herald the celestial arrival of the royal aircraft. The abrupt cessation of thunder, lightning, and torrents of rain that had broken a recent drought as his, as his plane landed. The expansive array of red, gold, and green banners, placards, and flags that waved in motion to the sounds of drum, as well as palm leaves that, that were reminiscent of Christ's entry into Jerusalem. And of course, there was the column of brilliant sunlight that came down upon the emperor as he stepped out onto the gangway of the plane and then spread across the crowd, drying them. 
And finally, the stone that the builder refused. It was Ross Mortimo Plano of the Dungle who was summoned to embark the emperor from his plane and move him from this chaos. So I argue what happened in the rest of the visit was as much, if not more, a rite of, a rite of passage, a profound transformation for the Rastafari movement, for the people of the movement, as well as the Jamaican people. Um, the way in which the energy with which that day is remembered and the questions that were later posed, the kind of statements that His Majesty made, um, went to fundamental questions about identity. They were, they were involved in the questions of identity. Who are you? What is your place in the world? Where do you come from? What is your ultimate destiny and future? All of this essentially was, was addressed by His Majesty in the, in the following days. Now let me, let me jump to that. When His Majesty first publicly spoke, he, he did so at, at National Stadium, and he said that he thanked the Jamaican people for the support that they had given to Ethiopia during the Italian occupation. He said he knew that, that Jamaicans of African blood had supported their liberation. He also went on to say that the Ethiopian people and the Jamaican people were blood brothers with long relationships. The following day in the reception for the governor general, he stated that Jamaica is part of Africa. He went on to continually note the history of relations between the of positive sentiments between the two countries and, he, and stating again with African blood, wherever there is shared African blood, there's a basis for greater unity. Citing the commonality of interests of countries like Ethiopia and Jamaica as small states, he urged that they raise their voices together in the Council of Nations. And in this sense, he made another signature statement that stands out from his visit to Trinidad or Barbados or Haiti. He said, with respect to the OAU, that, that commonality of interest is why we have sought to include Jamaica too, that is in the Organization of African Unity. And then looking forward to the, to the future development, he, he talked much about education and of course laid the cornerstone for the school that is at Payne Avenue today. All of these statements were, were framed based on his subsequent acts and based on the way the media handled this. All of these statements about blood brotherhood and affinity were, were framed in relation, I would argue, to the Rastafari. And the pivotal event that took place here that cemented this was the evening of his arrival of his first day, um, the reception that the governor general held for him at King's house, the emperor used that occasion to meddle 13 Rastafari leaders. After he did that, he commended them saying, continue your works, they're purposeful. Organize and centralize. The, the, this particular moment was critical because it happened at King's house, elevating the Rastafari, formerly the marginalized and demeaned semi-citizens of Jamaica, elevating them to the national stage for the first time and putting them in intimate contact with Jamaican elites. He did this, he did this in a, in, a, in, a, in a context affirming his relationship to the Rastafari. That act affirmed his relationship to the Rastafari. It's interesting that the Rastafari were continually persecuted in prior years 
for actually asserting that relationship. One might say that the king conferred a kind of legitimacy upon the brethren at that point. But as an anthropologist, I think it's a more complex than that. Because what he had done, what the, what the, the whole scenario painted was he had, he had meddled a group of Rastafari leaders who were already peripheral, who were already marginalized, but he had, make the, he had made them more acutely marginal than they were before. He had made them more acutely liminal than they were before. He had, he had exchanged their crosses for crowns, the cross and crown metaphor being one that we find in the multivocal symbolism of dreadlocks. He had crowned them, as it were, and by extension, the entire Rastafari community. Doing this in the context of King's House was significant because it was the last resistant bastion to colonial authority. And this, the, this, this positioned them uniquely, positioned the Rastafari community uniquely, um, giving them a moral authority from which over the next decade or more to engage with Jamaican society. And we in fact know what the upshot of that was. In fact, that liminal status, that one in which one is, one is in a dangerous position, but also a potentially extremely creative one, released energies that led to reggae music, a complete shift in the politics of Jamaica. Um, we, had, we had you Shearer and the, the leader of the opposition, Michael Manley going to Ethiopia, Siaga soon following after that. We had the emergence of a new mansion, the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, which in fact reopened the repatriation initiative that had been sidelined at the time of independence, right before independence. We had the arrival of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church um, and we had a new era of the blackening of Jamaica. How am I doing on time, my dear? I'm out of time? Yes, you can wrap up actually. Can't be out of time. I'm jumping. I'm now. I'm completely jumping to the kinds of, of civic art that we saw efflorescent after the um, after the uh, visit of His Majesty. Um, interestingly, here we have we have His Majesty Garvey, Paul Bogle, Granny Nanny, and King Prempe, who was in the Ashanti Wars of of the late 19th century. Um, the commonality between black liberators in Jamaica and African liberators being part of the whole Pan-African theme. Later on, we, we, see, we see wall murals like this that suggest, that suggest the emperor's um, uh, attitude toward gender relations and the, and the movement in which the direction has gone in more recent years. These kinds of wall murals basically were such that they transformed humble ghetto yards into temples and sites for spiritual ascension. They transformed shops um, and, and Rastafari businesses into culture, sites of cultural activity. This is the, the uh, Rastafari centralization organization at Racecourse, the Arts by Ross Wittedred. Um, sadly, you know, to, to honors talk, many of these murals are now gone or faded. The production of Rastafari banners is another aspect of this. I'm gonna close with this slide. This is, this is a slide from my brethren Jelani Naya uh, in Pembroke Hall around 2011. I may, in discussing the nature of Rastafari as a multivocal symbol, the emperor is in play and he's in no fixed relationship to any reference, Jamaican or Pan-African or, or whatever. Uh, this, this slide here reminds me of the, the entire message of the emperor's visit. 
Notice that Usain Bolt, Miss Lou, and, and Bob are backgrounded in the national, by the national flag. But look at His Majesty as an adjunct symbol here. I first looked at this and thought it was fire in the background, but no, it's fluid, it's blood. It is the blood, it is the African blood that joins these diasporic Africans with him as the metonym of Africa itself is representing all of Africa. There's multiple ways in which we might interpret this. Um, but as I'm out of time now, I'll leave the, I'll leave the larger discussion about, about His Majesty as a multivocal symbol, the complexities of his symbolism. I just want to say one more thing about, his, about his, the complexity of, of his symbolic. In recent years, and by recent years in the last 10, 15 years, it's increasingly the, 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 the case that in pointing to a picture or photograph of, of the emperor, a brethren or sister might say to you, when you see his majesty, what do you see? Do you see a black man? Do you see a brown man? Do you see a white man? No, you see every man. In some sense, that ambiguity is much like Jamaica itself, a black nation in the vernacular conception, a multiracial nation by its formal declaration. But it's a nation that is sending a message of one love to the entire world. So I can do no better than say, leave you with the words of his majesty at a moment when perhaps we are actually looking at a global reckoning on issues of racial justice and equality. I leave you with his words. We must become something that our education and experience has ill prepared us for. We must become more courageous, greater in spirit, broader in vision. We must become members of a new race, overcoming petty prejudice, and owing our allegiance not to nations, but to the community of our fellow man. Hail Rastafari. Thank you so much, Jake, for locating Rastafari. Rastafari. Aye, aye. His Imperial Majesty, a symbol of Jamaica nationhood. And there are so many ways in which we know this. This is evidence in the circulation of images in a developed visual culture, as you've told us. Images which function as surrogates, in fact, I would like to say as ventriloquisms of Rastafari. And you tell us Rastafari is a multivocal symbol. So the people's symbols, colleagues, are varied and tell different stories, different stories from the dominant colonial narrative. And I'm now left to ask you, our presenters, in one minute, what do you want to leave with the audience? Your, your final words, your closing remarks. What do you want to say about the people's symbols and how varied, how, diff how, 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 how much they tell us different stories from the dominant colonial narratives that have been left with us even in this post-colonial time? And you can go in any order that you, you so feel. Um, and I want to just remind those who are joining us on Facebook those who are here with us on, on Zoom. If you have a burning question, send it to the host. You can do that um, in the chat. And I will, um, you know, make your, your, your question. If it's a burning question, I will, I will make it known. So over to our speakers with their final comments or remarks. I also want to remind us um, as we are getting our final remarks ready. Um, we can show the slides from Honor and maybe um, now is a good time as we say our closing remarks, our technical team will allow the sharing of those um, slides. Perhaps we take them as we go out with some music after we take our closing remarks. Yannick, any closing remarks? Bert? Yeah, I, would just add, I would just say that um, the power of our symbols are in the power of which we're able to decode them. And this is oftentimes animated by an ability to discern. Yeah. 
Yes, indeed. The discerning ones will be able to see, smell, taste, even when sometimes what is in front of the eye is invisible. Closing remarks, Blacko? I'm calling on you in any particular order. In no particular order, I should say. Anyone? I would, I would offer a remark um, that, that comes from um, my other, the other hat I've worn over many years at the Smithsonian, which is directing an archive. And so, you know, in addition to discernment, there's remembrance. And this, this kind of goes with Honor Ford Smith's remarks. Remembering these, these symbols and remembering the stories and narratives that are associated with them. It's quite so clear to me, uh, having worked on this book about testimonies associated with the emperor's visit, that we haven't even scratched the surface. There is so much more there and we're, we're at a moment in time when the generation of those who witnessed, many of those who were middle-aged are now gone. Mm -hmm. The heads who were, who were witnessed are, were gone long before. But now we're at a point where, where individuals who were, who were eight, 10 years old, eight, 10, 12 years old, are also you know, transitioning. So it's, I think there's a duty to document and record these things that are part of the, na of the national patrimony. Uh, they're part of the intangible cultural history and the, 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 the narrative history, the orature that tends to be forgotten, as, as others on this panel have said. So I, I counsel remembrance and diligence in that Remembrance area. and diligence. I want to also ask um, Blacka, perhaps, Anna, perhaps, maybe yeah. Anna can give us her closing remarks as we take her images. Yes. Well, am I muted? Yeah, no. No, am we I... can hear you. <clears throat> okay, first of all, I made a mistake. I want to thank Blacka very much. I didn't big up Blacka because it was. Blacker, who there were two people who got me first interested in the murals. The first one was Sharon. She's the partner of, um, my, I'm getting old, so my head is gathering water. Um, <laughs> Evan's wife, who would not like me to address her thusly, but Sharon I want Chaka. to thank her very much for Sharon Chaka. Thank you. And the other person was Blacker. Um, and Blacka helped me initially. So I want to big them up. I want to also big up all of the, the painters that I haven't been able to call all their names, um, but all of the painters whose work uh, provides um, the basis of this presentation, who are extremely humble people who, who work for next to nothing and who manage to produce these amazing pieces of work and who have very graciously submitted to the destruction of their work without um, burning down anything like a police station. I, I want to end by saying I have a big concern as we think about memory and it is um, that when we talk about nation, increasingly we talk about nation not so much as an imagined community or a set of relationships which we have with each other, but more as a, as a thing, as a commodity, as a brand. And it makes me very concerned that this, uh, that you know, we have reduced the notion of community to the notion of a brand. And this, I think, has to do with the way in which um, neoliberalism has kind of taken over the discourse. What I think um, we need to look at these murals to think about and think not just the murals but also many of the presentations. Yeah, it's amazing presentation about you know what I like about to call the clothes now. About the what? 
Oh, sorry. About the um about the, the spirituality of women, uh, the women's symbols, um, and the women's spirituality, which I like to call a, a sort of spirituality of care, that we think about what what kind of alternative world would we like to live in and what do these 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 particular um images and ideas that have been presented here today help us to imagine a, a world in which we can have equal and sustainable relationships with each other that is not based on this horrific uh, inequality that still uh, exists in jamaica and a, a situation where you can still read off somebody's class and color from their body and how they speak. What kind of alternative would we like to have? And how can we bring back a discussion or bring a discussion of alternatives uh, alongside this, this, this ongoing language of branding and commodities and, and, um, and, marketing which seems to so have so much constraint the way that we speak to each other and the way that we imagine and reduce our relationship commodity for exchange so that's what i'd like you to, to that's what i'd like to leave with you so thank you blacker all right um, so thank you anna i, I yeah. want to quickly leave one last thing um as i'm interested in space and please and the geography of a place like Trenchtown. I wanted to point out to the, 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 the notion that our speech is, is, is represented, helps to either preserve power or contest power. And I wanted to invite everybody to, in your own time, look on two music videos on YouTube. Look on Junior Gang's Welcome to Jamrock and Junior Gang's Living It Up. Both of them draw on Trenchtown, but in different ways. And ask yourself, how is meaning being produced here and how is space is being represented here? That's it. Thank you very much, Blacko. Do we have any remarks from Bert? Um, I wanted to just give everyone an opportunity to, to close, Dahlia. Yes, I, I yes? just wanted to say, um, when we talk about language, you know, the Rastafari principle of word, sound, and power, that there's a power essence being encapsulated in a name or a word, or the things that we say, and, and the Rastafari contestation of language in the way they modify vocabulary and dialect um, reinforces the importance of language as a national symbol and that it's something that that more work needs to be done we honestly can't overlook and that um, if we are going to honestly say that language represents people and values that it's something that must reflect the people and something that people should be able to connect with and, and access. So Bert um, just want to tell us before Bert um, comes in that we do have some questions um, that have been posed to us. And I, I, even if we are not able to answer them in this moment, I want to, um, I feel committed to airing them because they're, they're, they're questions, burning questions or comments on the part of our audience members. Um, and so Bert, you can come in at any time. Yes, I just want to say as we talk about symbols, symbols that represent us and symbols that betray us. And the greatest betrayal of us is the symbol of the Queen of England remaining at the pinnacle of the Constitution and remaining owners of crown lands. And that must go before we can now put in its place the new symbols. We need to take her down. Thank you. And I and so say all of us. I, I really believe that we should. There is no place for the Queen in Jamaica at this time. I want to just voice some of the, the, the comments and questions, even if we're not able to respond, but you can let me know, um, speakers, if you do want to. One question from Dre. Have there been any symbols that have been elevated to the status of nationally symbolic um, or, or that of the nationally symbolic in post-independent Jamaica? In other words, he says, are national symbols dy dynamic in that new generations get to expand the list of what is considered such? And I, I, Bert, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but in my own lifetime, I was born in 1970. I haven't seen any symbols become added to the list of national symbols in post-independent post Jamaica. And, and so 
and, and, and we can almost say the same thing about our national heroes, that there are ways in which the new generation, the things that represent us as, as people of Jamaica, it, it's not dynamic at all. The committees of government that are supposed to be meeting to make decisions about these things are not meeting. And so there's a way in which you could assume it is, it is not a dynamic arrangement at all. And we want to correct those things. We also have a, a comment, a question from Hugh. How are we now listening to the voice of every man, every woman, where their voices are heard and used to create change. He says the work of the ordinary Jamaican in the construction of what we know to be our identity has formed center stage in these wonderful presentations. But how are we now listening to the voice of the ordinary man, the ordinary woman? Where are their voices being heard and used to create change? You can think on that, presenters. And um, I want us to, 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 to really consider that what we've shared here this afternoon with our friends and colleagues and listeners far and wide on Facebook and with us on Zoom is really an excavation of the conversation, a continuing conversation about independence, a, a conversation about freedom, a conversation about defining our own identity and our spaces of, of, of being. That indeed and in fact, when we think about Jamaica as an independent country since 1962, there are ways in which we are not independent. There are ways in which we must excise that word from our vocabulary when we begin to think about Jamaica because there are so many ways in which we are not independent. We remain people striving to complete the process of emancipation in the way that Erna Broadbar reminded us. So I want to close by thanking the team at the ICS for rising to the call of duty every time. I want to thank our technical team, Isabel Dennis. I want to thank our coordinators, assistants, the Cadian, Cadian Williams and Bettine Ross Laws. I want to thank our PR team and thank the coordinator of the event, member of the National Reparations Council for the vision behind this summer series, Dr. Jelani Nayo. This event wouldn't be possible without our speakers and I want to thank all of you for giving of your time in this, the second in our summer series of engagements. Audience, listen out for more in the series as we continue to bring you cutting edge conversations on the ways in which we live and have our being in post-colonial Jamaica. Thank you very much all. <laughs>